Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Roshni Chakshi, author of the new novel, Aru Shah and the Nectar of Immortality, which is the fifth and final book in the Pandava Quintet. Kirkus Reviews wrote about Aru Shah and the Nectar of Immortality, a deeply satisfying conclusion to a superb groundbreaking series. Roshni, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, uh, novel Aru Shah and the Nectar of Immortality, how would you describe the novel? I would describe it as a mix of the Greek mythological adventures you would find in Percy Jackson, Percy, Percy Jackson, <laughs> Percy Jackson in the Olympian series, um, the girl power and fun of Sailor Moon, and a healthy mix of the sort of vivid mythology you would find from Hinduism and the Indian subcontinent. That's great. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write the Pandava Quintet novels? Yeah, you know, when I was growing up, my grandmother would especially tell us tons upon tons of stories from the Mahabharata, which is a ancient Sanskrit epic. And it centers around the lives and adventures of these Pandava brothers, who were these legendary demigods. They were the sons of the god of the sun, the god of thunder and lightning, the god of death, the wind, sunrise and sunset, etc. And uh, to me, I was just, they, they were my original superheroes, right? Like, <laughs> These were the people whose adventures I was following wide-eyed, unblinking, um, and that I would dream about when I went to sleep. And there was something about their stories taking place in, place in ancient India that I wanted to really revisit as I got older. I was curious, you know, Hindus, we believe in reincarnation. We believe that the soul can be reborn into multiple different forms um, and take on any kind of gender. And so I was really curious about what would it be like if these bonds of brothers were reincarnated in modern times and as 12-year-old girls, what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> so what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? You know, it's interesting. I, I, um... My first book sold in 2015, um, and I was in my first year of law school at the time. And <laughs> so the sort of process that led up to it, if I'm being completely honest, was a great, a terrible sense of rejection. I had been trying to sell stories for years. I'd been writing stories for, for eons. And when I graduated college, I remember feeling the sort of sinking pit of despair. I feel like all of my other friends had graduated, were taking like six-figure cushy jobs, and I graduated with uh, no job prospects. I ended up working as a secretary in a frigid tax law office next to a haunted ficus plant, which I still don't know to this day if it was real or fake, but I'm convinced that it stalked me. And I, I was studying for the LSAT at the time, and it was this moment of feeling a very, very deep sense of failure. And I'm so grateful for that time because it felt private. I, I didn't want to talk to other people about what I was doing. And that sense of failure was the thing that allowed me to let go of my ideas of success and to focus on something that delighted me. And that meant writing something that I had always wanted to find on the shelves. And that story was The Star-Touched Queen. And that ended up being my very first book to release and my first book to hit the New York Times bestseller list. Wow. So can you give us a sense? What, what were some of the stories uh, that you were writing in novels before you uh, were able to get that first novel published when you said you were just feeling this overwhelming sense of rejection? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because for me, I, it really took me until my 20s to honestly start putting someone like myself um, uh as a main character in my own books. And I think this is what we mean when we talk about the importance of children being able to see themselves in stories, regardless of race or religion, ethnicity. Um, it, it is very erasing. And honestly, I contributed to my own erasure in my stories. I used to write books where nobody looked like me because I had never seen anyone look like me in these stories. And so The Star-Touched Queen was the very first time that I actively drew from 
Hindu mythology and Hindu folklore, and at the same time borrowed from stories that I loved growing up, like the Norwegian East of the Sun, West of the Moon, the Greek myth of Cupid and Psyche, and at the same time, the Hindu story of Shiva and Parvati, which is this beautiful, epic love story that has reincarnation and gods and goddesses and a love that spans lifetimes. Um, Combining all of those things was basically one long love letter to myself. That's wonderful. Well, now that this is the fifth and final book in this series, have you started thinking about or even working on a new series or novel yet? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, (laughs) I've had the great fortune of being able to write um, in a ton of different spaces. Um, I wrote a lot. uh, I I finished my first young adult trilogy, The Gilded Wolves, which wrapped up in September. We're finishing Arushan, The End of Time series, which comes out, the final book comes out on Tuesday. And um, and now I find that I'm, I'm still interested in children's literature. It is a very, very sacred space for me because it is a place where you have so many moments of self discovery, so many moments of fear and wonder. Um, And at the same time, I'm very curious about the adult space too. And I feel like no matter where I'm wandering, I'm always taking a love of mythology and folklore with me. Well, I'm curious, you said that you grew up hearing these Hindu myths from your grandmother, I think you said. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you also, when you started working on this series, did you um, go back and research and read more about Hindu mythology? I did, actually. And it was something that was really, really rewarding for me because, um, you know, as with any kind of folklore and mythology, it really comes down to who is doing the telling. Um, There are multiple different variations on a myth, depending on what region of India that you're from. And it was interesting for me because it was this process of uh, letting go of how to tell the correct, true, or um, uh, the right version of a story. Because what I've learned from this entire process is that there is no such thing as one right version. And um, Arusha on the End of Time seeks to celebrate that. I mean, the very last book of the series is very much a love letter to the nature of storytelling and the eternal question that um, a story is immortal. And it really comes down to who is doing the telling. That's great. Well, this series is part of the Rick Reardon Presents publishing line. Mm-hmm. What have your interactions been with Rick during this process? Oh, Rick is wonderful. I, I am so indebted to the entire imprint for, for giving the Arush on the End of Time series a home in the first place. Um, and, you know, I, I had the great, great privilege of being able to get a lot of Rick's editorial insights when I first started writing the Irish on the End of Time series because it was my first foray into middle grade and into writing for that audience. And I remember that one of Rick's best pieces of advice to me was to maintain a sense of emotional urgency in a story. Um, I think so often with writers, we spend a lot of our time concerned with our research, concerned with our world building, concerned with polishing our prose so that it shines like a jewel. But at the end of the day, a story lives or dies on whether or not it succeeds in making you feel something, if it succeeds in provoking an emotional response. And that is something that I've carried with me across every single book I've written. That's great. Well, I'm curious, since this was a five-book series, what was your process? Did you write um, kind of an outline or a timeline across the five books before you started working and uh, writing the first one? Yeah. So for me, you know, it it came down to um, a sense of reverse engineering a story. I was really, (laughs) really curious, right? Like I I knew, I I always knew how Aru would end. Um, I knew how I wanted this character to emerge, what sort of person she would be. And it became this process of figuring out how she got there, because that is the journey that's interesting. And that's the journey that has to be able to sustain interest over five books. Have you wanted to use your home equity to pay off debt or improve your house, but found the old way too painful? There's now a new, better option for accessing your home equity. It's called HomePace. Here's the key. It's not a loan, so there's no monthly payments or interest. Instead, HomePace gives you money up front as an investment in your home. That's right, you get money that you can use however you want without the burden of monthly payments. Then someday when you decide to sell, you share a portion of the gains or losses in your home's value with HomePace. 
That means if your home's value drops, HomePace takes a loss too. HomePace gives homeowners a better choice to access home equity. No monthly payments, no interest. To get an instant quote, go to HomePace.com slash quote. It takes less than five minutes. That's HomePace slash quote to get started. Sure. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? I think my best writing advice is to maintain a deep sense of curiosity. Um, we're really, really interested in human interest stories, right? Like we're, we're curious about uh, who someone was and whether they were similar to us. And I think that, you know, when we come up with characters, we often ask ourselves, what do they want? What were they, what do they need? What are they scared of? But when we ask deeper, more probing questions, such as what does the character feel guilty of? What does a character feel shame over? This is when we start really itching deeply into these human experiences. And that's where these stories become intensely relatable. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, um, most recently, uh, I finished reading a nonfiction book called Entangled Lives by, I think, Merlin Sheldrake. And it's this really wonderful nonfiction book that deals with mycelium and mushrooms and fungi. <laughs> and I know it sounds absolutely bizarre, but let's imagine that you're walking through a forest and this surrounded by the silence of trees and what have you. But one thing we're not even aware of is that right beneath our feet, inches below it, is this vast sprawling mycelial network, and it's essentially a screaming internet. It would be like observing humankind, but taking the digital age out of it and not even factoring in the internet. So there's something about it that I just find really, really interesting, like life at a, at a cellular level. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? Oh, well, you can find me online on Instagram. Most commonly, I'm posting about like my cat or something that I made that day or my, my writing status and updates on projects. And you can find out where I'm going, things that I've written in the past, and more about my work on my website, which is www.roshnichakshi.com. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Roshni Chakshi, author of the new novel, Arusha and the Nectar of Immortality, the fifth and final book in the Pandava Quintet. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Roshni, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. That was great. The problem with growing up around highly dangerous things is that after a while, you just get used to them. For as long as she could remember, Aru had lived in the Museum of Ancient Indian Art and Culture, and she knew full well that the lamp at the end of the Hall of the Gods was not to be touched. She could mention the Lamp of Destruction, the way a pirate who had tamed a sea monster could casually say, Oh, you mean old Ralph here? But even though she was used to the lamp, she had never once lit it. That would be against the rules. The rules she went over every Saturday when she led the afternoon visitors tour. Some folks may not like the idea of working on a weekend, but it never felt like work to Aru. It felt like a ceremony, like a secret. She would don her crisp scarlet vest with its three honeybee buttons. She would imitate her mother's museum curator voice, and people, this was the best part of all, would listen. Their eyes never left her face especially when she talked about the cursed lamp. Sometimes she thought it was the most fascinating thing she ever discussed. A cursed lamp is a much more interesting topic than, say, a visit to the dentist, although one could argue that both are cursed. Aru had lived at the museum for so long, it kept no secrets from her. She had grown up reading and doing her homework beneath the giant stone elephant at the entrance. Often she'd fall asleep in the theater and wake up just before the crackling self-guided tour recording announced that India became independent from the British in 1947. She even regularly hid a stash of candy in the mouth of a 400-year-old sea dragon statue, she named it Steve, in the West Wing. Aru knew everything about everything in the museum, except one thing. The lamp. 
for the most part, it remained a mystery. It's not quite a lamp, her mother, renowned curator and archaeologist Dr. K.P. Shaw, had told her the first time she showed it to Aru. We call it a dia. Aru remembered pressing her nose against the glass case, staring at the lump of clay. As far as cursed objects went, this was by far the most boring. It was shaped like a pinched hockey puck. Small markings, like bite marks, crimped the edges. And yet, for all its normalness, even the statues filling the Hall of the Gods seemed to lean away from the lamp, giving it a wide berth. Why can't we light it? She had asked her mother. Her mother hadn't met her gaze. Sometimes light illuminates things that are better left in the dark. Besides, you never know who is watching. Well, Aru had watched. She'd been watching her entire life. Every day after school, she would come home, hang her backpack from the stone elephant's trunk, and creep toward the Hall of the Gods. It was the museum's most popular exhibit, filled with a hundred statues of various Hindu gods. Her mother had lined the walls with tall mirrors so visitors could see the artifacts from all angles. The mirrors were vintage, a word Aru had used when she traded Burton Prater a greenish penny for a whopping two dollars and half a Twix bar. Because of the tall crepe myrtles and elms standing outside the windows, the light that filtered into the Hall of the Gods always looked a little muted, feathered almost, as if the statues were wearing crowns of light. Aru would stand at the entrance, her gaze resting on her favorite statues. Lord Indra, the king of the heavens, wielding a thunderbolt. Lord Krishna, playing his flutes. The Buddha, sitting with his spine straight and legs folded in meditation before her eyes would inevitably be drawn to the dia in its glass case. She would stand there for minutes, waiting for something, anything that would make the next day at school more interesting, or make people notice that she, Aru Shah, wasn't just another seventh grader slouching through middle school, but someone extraordinary. Aru was waiting for magic, and every day she was disappointed. To make a rich, smooth cold brew, Tim Horton steeps 100% Arabica beans for 16 hours. What could be richer than that? Well, uh... How about blending in swirls of sweet Irish cream? Rich enough? Ooh, I guess. Not quite, because Tim Hortons tops that cold brew with the cloud of sweet cold foam. Now, what could be richer than that? Nothing? Exactly. Irish cream cold brew with cold foam now at Tim Hortons. Or try cold foam on any of your Tim Hortons favorites. Modifications extra for a limited time at participating U.S. locations. Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner. Really testing the limits of that phrase. The more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. 